Well, my name is Pat Barnhouse. I'm a retired Naval Commander and from 1965 until 1968 I was in the Hydrofoil Project Office. My main role there was looking after the combat systems equipment, the fighting equipment as it was called in those days. The project was very much underfunded to start with. I think originally it actually came in at about eight million dollars and uh, very quickly when some studies were done it was realized that that was nowhere near the amount of money was required and over time with the uh, findings of what, what was required that the price kept rising and until it reached about 40 million dollars and then there was a very disastrous fire in the shipyard in Sorel where the hydrofoil was being built and that uh, caused about a year's delay on the project and also caused another rise of about another 10 million dollars in the project and it landed up going over 50 million dollars. Some of the interesting uh, aspects of the uh, technology going into the hydrofoil besides the the foils themselves um, we used gas turbines it was the first time the Navy had really used gas turbines for propulsion um, that, that general that paid out off because uh, the next generation of warships we built also went to gas gas turbine propulsion um, the variable sonar that was used was uh, was the body was designed so that uh, it would tow at depth but it was felt that when the ship went on it, up on its hydrofoil and started going very fast, the body would kite out behind the, the ship and it wouldn't be any use for the ship while it's flying at high speed. Uh, but once it uh, settled down onto this hull again at low speed, the body would then deploy down to a, a proper depth and be, be usable as an as a ASW uh, sonar device. Um, that was, that then became part of the operating procedure that was put together for the hydrofoil. Uh, they, were, they were going to operate in what was called the, the grasshopper mode. The hydrofoil would be out at sea on its, on its hull with its sonar running and if it got a datum, a, a, a detection of a, a submarine somewhere, it would immediately uh, rise up on its foils, rush towards that datum where the, where it last the submarine was uh, detected to be then when it got into the vicinity, it would once more come down on its hull, let its, uh, hydro its sonar sink down, the rail with its sonar sink down, and uh, ping again, get another datum on the hydrofoil, zap to the new datum, and so on, until it took close the, the gap and was close enough to launch a torpedo at the hydrofoil. The staff was the first combined National Defense Department of Defense Production project office which became the norm for all big naval or DND projects after that, but we were the first one. So we had an office where we had about, um, the captain was running the office and his, his deputy was a man from the Defar Department of Temp Defense Production. Uh, we had about four people from DDP and uh, we had um, one, two, three or four naval officers on staff and that was about it. Uh, there was one marine engineer, um, there's two marine engineers, there's two combat systems engineers as they're called now, and uh, one uh, surface naval officer who was going to become the first captain of the, the Hydrofoil when it was commissioned. Everybody in the, in the office of course was very excited about it. Um, <clears throat> I think there was mixed feelings feelings in national defense. We, got, we had quite a lot of support. We had support from one very high-ranking high na naval officer, a uh, fellow named uh, Admiral, oh, was he a Commodore at the time? Commodore Bob Welland, who was really, really supportive. He was a kind of an innovative man. He, 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 uh, he liked the ideas, of the, these kind of ideas. So he was supportive. But um, the, the, the problem is the, you get the support, but then there's the, the word money comes up. And Trying to find enough, enough money to pre carry on all the projects the Navy was doing, it's, this was very, very difficult. And I think that was really what, it was the killer in the end. Uh, there's more to it than that, but 
the, when you've only got so many million dollars or so many billion dollars to do, to do so many projects and you try to rank them in priority of, your, of, your, of what you want to do, uh, somehow or the other you, you don't get everything you want. And the Hydrofold didn't rank as high, I suppose, as, as some of the other projects. Um, I think the problem is that the Hydrofold is not the flexible vehicle that a, a destroyer could be. A destroyer could be a, a, a surface warfare uh, ship, it could be an anti-air warfare ship, it could be submarine warfare, it could be an un undersea warfare ship, it can uh, sow the flag in various countries, it can uh, carry people, uh, uh, vehicles and troops, and it, when you have to do it, you can carry people, deliver them somewhere. Whereas a hydrofoil was a small, very select, very one-purpose uh, vessel. So I think that probably had a, something to do with uh, the initial, the, the final de uh, decision not to go ahead with any more hydrofoils. Now, my, my particular role in there, I started out as the assistant on the, um, the combat systems, and my, my boss uh, was a commander who couldn't decide whether he was a university professor or a naval officer, and the university professor won out. He went off to the University of Toronto, was a professor of electro engineering. So I took over, and uh, I, I ran the, uh, the project, the, the, the contract that uh, procured the weapon system for the ship. Uh, the weapon system, by the way, the, 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 the variable depth sonar, the, the sonar hoist mechanism that went with it, the torpedoes, the torpedo launch system, uh, were never fitted. At all. And the, command and control, the final command and control system was never fitted either. It was all ready to go, but the project was put on hold in 1971, I believe it was, and uh, the, the stuff never did get fitted into the ship. Um, we did put in safe to go to sea uh, equipment, communications, radar, navigation. In fact, we had some kind of innovative things. Um, uh, we wanted to have a, and most ships have a thing called a polaris, which is their compass, which they, the, the, the people on the bridge use for taking bearings and directions and so on. There wasn't room on the, the bridge of the, uh, the hydrofoil, which was really more like a cockpit. So they built a, a special tear, uh, pull down on a kind of like a Canada arm type of arrangement, uh, pulled down the, the, a, a bearing thing which we, which we actually used for taking bearings. And it was very, very innovative. And we, to, to associate it with that was some very small, um, what they call, tape, tape uh, <coughs> compasses. They're, 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 they're a, a I'm sorry, I'm reading my hands again. They're a continuous tape uh, that gives you the, the bearing to the, somebody uh, uh, somewhere in the ship. And we had developed actually miniature versions for the hydrofoil, which uh, then found some uh, fairly wide uh, sales uh, venues outside, outside of Canada. That's always cutting edge. When you're doing something like a hydrofoil, yes, you're on the cutting edge. You really are. And I think we all were very enthusiastic. We, you know, we put in a lot of hours on it. I always uh, wanted to be there. Well, by that time I'd left. <laughs> I, I actually, I, my, my big, uh, I, 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 one thing that really bothered me, I never got to ride on the hydrofoil. I left in 1968 and went to another uh, infamous ship, the HMCS Bonaventure, uh, which had just come out of a very contentious refit. So um, I was on board her and I saw the, the uh, Brador flying around Halifax Harbor and in and out, and I said, "Boy, I'd love to have had a ride on that," and I never did. And I was sad to hear it was the thing was cancelled. Yes.